I want General Morgan to come up here, but what I, who I also want to come up here is Tom Trento to introduce Jerry Morgan. Tom Trento is the man who introduced me to General Morgan. Tom Trento is the man who Karen and I did not know, who came to be a friend to Karen and I after the SEAL Team 6 guys died. We didn't know who this man was, this mysterious man from somewhere down south that came to the memorial, wrote it on Facebook. We didn't know he was there. We saw his face on his Facebook. We wrote him back to try to contact him. Didn't hear from him for months. <laughs> didn't know if he really existed or not. And then all of a sudden, one day, he invites us to Tallahassee, and General Boykin was there. And that's where I first had the privilege to meet uh, General Jerry Boykin. Can, uh... Can you imagine? Can you imagine that uh, that April night, 1980, in the desert, group of men heading to a particular destination to rescue 50 three Americans from an evil regime. Can you imagine the training, the dedication, the commitment to one another? On that evening, eight of those men would not return alive. Can you imagine being involved in chasing down Manuel Noriega, the megalomaniac in Panama. Can you imagine going after Pablo Escobar in Colombia? Can you imagine getting hit with a couple of 50 caliber rounds and surviving? Can you imagine that very dark day in Mogadishu? Black Hawk Down. Can you imagine being part of bringing a team of men, a little Greek letter, Delta, together to do combat in a vicious, brutal, but just manner? Can you imagine being in the CIA working for those guys and the DOD? Can you imagine working for a Christian organization. Well, our guest this evening has done all of that and more. You can go through his CV all day long. Amen. But the most distinguishing element of this individual, 36 years in the military and service for his country, parenthetically, relax. There's always a wonderful woman behind a great man. Mrs. Ashley Boykin, can you stand up? That component that distinguishes this individual you're going to hear is simply an unending, a powerful, and everlasting belief in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Please, a nice Florida welcome to Jeremy Jeremy. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with uh, really a, a very dear friend, Colonel West and Angela. This is the first time I've met Angela, although, my wife talked to her uh, several years ago when Alan was on the front page of every paper. We had just gone through a similar thing and my wife said, I'm calling his wife because she needs a friend right now. Wow. And uh, she called, that's the, when we first got connected with the West family, is actually called to uh, encourage her because we had been through the same thing where we'd been beat up by the media. 
So it's a privilege to be here and, and obviously to be here with Billy and Karen. Uh, it's just a special, very special time for us. And we're running over time and I'm not going to keep you too long here. But uh, Molan LeBay. Amen. Yeah. Molan LeBay. Yeah. Well Literally means in the Greek, for those of you who don't speak Greek, it means come, take. Molan LeBay. Come, take. And that's exactly the way I feel too. Is uh, it is time for all of us to stand and fight? You know, I'm too old now. I'm uh, I'm at the point where I can draw Social Security now if I chose to. That's that's getting old. But uh, I, I'm still in the gym every day, so I'm not that old. But I've got no patience with cowards anymore. I've got no patience with politicians or preachers that can't stand up and speak the truth. That's one of the reasons that there was such an all-out assault on Alan West. You never had to figure out what he was trying to say. You never had to read between the lines. And I, even while he was still in Congress, I used to say, the most popular politician in America today is Alan West because he's the only one that doesn't speak in politically correct terms. <laughs> but we're here to honor 30 men. It's not just the 22 seals. It's not just Aaron. It's, it, we're here this weekend to honor the lives of 30 Americans that were killed on the 6th of August. 2011 when a helicopter went down. But let me ask you this question. Just ponder this for a second. Who would you rather have leading your son or your daughter? A man that would break the rules to protect their lives? Yes. Yep. Or a man that would not let them take out gun emplacements that they knew were a threat to a helicopter because of some stupid notion of rules of engagement that are going to get people killed? <laughs> That is pretty clear. You see, those those men were following in the footsteps of other great men in America. You see, we honor them, and this is their time. This is the weekend when we honor them. But you know what? They come in a long line of men that have been willing to step forward, and women that have been willing to step forward and say, as Isaiah said in six eight, "Here am I, send me." Yes, you got to remember, there are. There are no conscripts on that battlefield today. There haven't been for two or three decades now. Three decades. They're all volunteers. They're there. And when you look at the SEAL community, they're a triple volunteer at, at least. They're there because they wanted to be there. They follow in the line of a long historic line of great patriots and great warriors. Well, what is a warrior? You see, we talk about it. We throw that term around. We use that term all the time. I just wrote another book with a great theologian named Stu Weber from Portland, Oregon. We wrote a book called The Warrior Soul. And we talk about what's the warrior and here's it's what the warrior is. The warrior is not the one with the most bandoliers. Not the one with the longest shooting gun. The most grenades hanging off of it. That's not the warrior. You see, I can tell you that because I'm, I'm married to a warrior. I really am. I'm married to a warrior. You see, a warrior is the person that says, this is what I love. This is what I care about. This is my country. This is my family. This is my faith. And this is what threatens it. This is the left. This is the Marxist, the Islamist. This is the evil that resides in our government today. And the warrior is the one that says, I'll protect what I love. I stand in between what threatens it and what I love. I stand between it. And for you to get to that, for you to get to what I love, you got to come through me. you got to come over me. See, that's the warrior. And that's the kind of people that were on a helicopter that day. They were the people that served for a transcendent cause. That transcendent cause is encapsulated in this document right here. This particular document happens to be very special to me. Because it says, to my dear husband Jerry, 
who defends this precious document every day of his life. Love Ashley. Isaiah 6 8. The Constitution of the United States. You see, 80% of the people in this room today, the men at least, and some of the women, took an oath to this Constitution. They said, I do solemnly swear to God, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all the enemies, foreign and domestic. Aaron Vaughn and all 30 of those people on that aircraft that day took that oath. And whether they were officer or enlisted, it didn't matter. They took the same oath, essentially, to support and defend that Constitution. That became their transcendent cause. It became the cause that was bigger than them that day. But they're, they come along behind other great men and women that have paid a price. Think about the 56 men that came into Philadelphia and took a vote on the 2nd of July. We get a little confused on this, but they took a vote on the 2nd of July. Next Thursday, we will celebrate the birth of this nation. But think about those 56 men that took that vote. Think about the sickly Caesar Rodney who knew that he had to make it to Philadelphia from his home down in eastern Delaware. Caesar Rodney, a man that now we believe he probably had cancer, he rode in a, in a driving rain all night to get to Philadelphia so he could cast the vote. The deciding vote to separate from the crown of England. But when those 56 men signed that document, or at least when they took the vote and ultimately signed that document, they drew big targets on their chest. That, see, that's the kind of courage. That's the kind of moral courage that these men were following in the footsteps. Those 30 men that went down were following in the footsteps of men like those that came into Philadelphia and voted to separate from the crown of England because they knew that if they failed in this revolution, they would be executed as traitors to the crown of England. That's courage. That's moral courage. I just wrote an article for Billy Graham's magazine about these men and about what moral courage is. And where is the moral courage today? I've got to tell you, here's a man that has moral courage. Ted Cruz is another one that has moral courage before he, he absolutely does. Before he, before he stood up and filibustered, he called a bunch of us to his office. We had Ted, actually, Mike Lee's office, and he said, I'm going to do this, and my old party's going to hate me. He said, I just sat in Kerrville, Texas. And he said, I talked to the businessman in Kerrville, Texas. One told me he's not going to be able to hire anybody else if we don't stop Obamacare. Another one told me he's going to have to lay people off if we don't stop Obamacare. Another one told me that he's just took out a loan to start a business, but he's not going to do it because of Obamacare. And they pleaded with me to do what I'm about to do. He said, I promised them I would, and I'm going to now. But it's going to cost. He said that to us. That's the kind of courage. See, that's moral courage. And that's also the kind of courage that those 30 men had when they piled into that Chinook that day and they answered the call because, see, they were not running from the fight. They were running to the fight. They were smelling the cordite. And Alan will tell you, and all of these guys in here that have been in combat, they'll tell you there's something about the smell of cordite that just brings about a something in it. You, you can't even explain it. Or the sound of a machine gun firing a six to nine round burst. It does something to you. And you want to get in the action. You want to go. You want to go to where the cordite is coming from. You want to go to the sound of the guns. And that's what those men were doing when they went down in that Chinook. The question is, did it have to be that way? We can debate it forever. You've addressed that in your book, Billy, you and Karen. And it's not my purpose to stand up here tonight and debate that. But I can tell you that as far as I'm concerned, the leadership has yet to be held accountable for what occurred that night. That's my That's own right. personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Those were men of courage. They ran to the gun. They ran to the smell of cordite. There's 56 men that voted to separate. They brought us two things. They brought us war and they brought us freedom. So we had to fight for seven years 
to gain independence. And remember that you cannot separate the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. It was a continuum. The second phase was to come back to Philadelphia years later and write a Constitution. Now you don't have to believe what I believe, and I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not going to have an altar call. I may take up a collection. <laughs> And all you Baptists in here, yeah. I see a couple of beers on the table in front of you. How many of you are Lutherans? <laughs> Where, uh, come on, I know there's at least one Lutheran in here. Wherever you find four Lutherans, you'll find a fifth. <laughs> Look, I know I've thrown out a few big words, and I, I know some of you Marines in here are struggling with those big words. So I'm going to tell you a story there, Victoria. Let me tell you this story. So this Marine, you know, Marines are not as smart as the Army. So this Marine, he got him a weekend job, and he got him a job at a pharmacy. And he was working in this pharmacy about a month, and the pharmacist came in one Saturday morning and said, I'll tell you what, said, Look, he said, you know how things work here. I've got to go across to the bank. So he said, I'm going over to the bank. I'll be back in 10 minutes. He got over to the bank, and there was a long line, and he couldn't get back right away. It took him about an hour. Finally, he came back, and as he came back, there was a man standing in front of the pharmacy like this. He walked in the pharmacy, walked up to that Marine that was moonlighting, and he said, hey, what is wrong with that guy standing outside there? The Marine said, oh, that guy, oh, that guy, oh, yeah. He said, that guy came in here with the worst case of bronchitis I have ever seen. He said, he was coughing his head off. The pharmacist said, well, what did you do? He said, I gave him a laxative. <laughs> you did what? That won't stop a cough. He said, well, just look at him. He's afraid to cough. <laughs> Cherry Point Marine Air Base, by the way, in case you want to know. I, my dad was with the Marine Corps for 32 years. I do love the Marine Corps. I do. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm still looking for people that stand on principle in our country today. Leaders that stand on principle. Leaders that don't cave and run and and, and compromise every time things get tough. I'm looking for real leaders in this country today, but especially in the church. See, one of my big disappointments today is that the church is compromised. The people inside the church have started compromising on every issue that I think is fundamental to the character of this nation. You see, I, I have my own religious beliefs. I'm an ordained minister. As I said, I'm not going to preach to you, but let me just say this to you. I believe that what America has to do is return to our founding values. And the founding values of those 56 men were Judeo-Christian values. Yes. They respected life and liberty. Some of you say, well, they, they allowed slavery. Yeah, they did allow slavery, but you know what brought an end to slavery? It was the church in America that actually brought an end to slavery as they went across the Appalachian Mountains and started what became known as the Second Great Awakening. It raised the awareness and the conscience of America to understand that you can't really believe these words. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. And among those is life, liberty, and the pursuit of heaven. You can't believe those words and hold a black man a slave. That was the church that brought about the second great awakening and ultimately brought about the civil war to rid this country of the evil of slavery. And I think for me, from my perspective, it is time now for people of faith. Regardless of what your theology is, it's time for people of faith to rise up and start taking a stand because the left is trying to tell you that you have freedom of 
worship. And that is not what your constitution gives you. Your constitution gives you freedom of religion. Amen. And that means that I can not only believe what I want to believe, but I can live my faith and I can speak about it in the public square. Yes. Because regardless of what the modern historians will tell you, is those 56 men were men of the Christian faith. They were men of the Christian faith and they were not deists, as many have said. I think it's time for us to return to those founding values. You know, 29 of those men actually went to universities and colleges that taught theology. They didn't get theology degrees, but they actually went to colleges that taught theology. And the reality is nine of those men died during the revolution. Now those men that drew a big target on their own chest when they signed that document died in the revolution. Two gave their sons and many lost everything. I'm from Virginia. I'm a Virginian. And one of the great stories that you're probably all aware of is a, is a man in Virginia named Thomas Nelson that owned a big plantation in what is the, ultimately became the Yorktown battlefield where Washington ultimately defeated Cornwallis. He owned a huge plantation. He was a very wealthy man, but Cornwallis had occupied his manor, his home, his estate, and made it his headquarters. And when the question of what to do came up, Thomas Nelson looked at George Washington and said, bomb it. Shoot everything you got on it and level it. He'd spent his entire life building this place. But because Cornwallis was using it, he said, level it. He died a pauper. Thomas Nelson, a man of great wealth, died a pauper. But that's the kind of sacrifice and commitment and courage that has helped to make us a great nation. Those 30 men that went down were following in the footsteps of other great men before them that have paid a tremendous price for this country to be the great nation that we are today. What's my generation doing to preserve it? That's the question. As my wife and I watched our six grandchildren playing in our home, three of which are boys at that time under three. And we don't medicate our boys either, by the way. <laughs> Can you imagine three of them? <laughs> under three? Oh, man. You know how it is, grandparents? You love to see them come? You love to see them go? But when we left, my wife and I stood in the kitchen and we said, you know, she, she actually said to me something very profound. She said, it's not about us anymore. It's about those six, those six children. It's about what kind of future they're going to have. You see, I'm actually hopeful. I'm proud to be an American. And I'm proud to be an American because people like Aaron Vaughn and the 29 other men that were on a helicopter, they have given me the right to be proud to be an American. Sadly, even in our school systems, we're denying children today the opportunity to be proud to be Americans. We won't let them wear an American flag on Cinco de Mayo. We're taking down symbols of the history and the lineage of this nation. We don't respect the American flag. We don't have them say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. And sometimes they're even criticized when they do. But I'm proud to be an American. Me too. Because these men, starting with those 56 that signed that declaration, right on up through the veterans that are serving today in Iraq and are in Afghanistan, they bought the opportunity for me to be proud to be an American. And I am proud to be American. We should all be proud to be Americans. Look at what America has done for the world. We have been the greatest nation. We've paid the greatest price. We've freed over 60 million people in Iraq and Afghanistan and given them an opportunity. We saved two continents in World War II. We went into the port of Pusan in June of 1950 and turned the whole tide of war into the Korean War. Look at all that America's done. 
We have every right to be proud to be Americans. I'm going to wrap it up by telling you a story because we're, we're running late here. I, I really am proud to be an American. And I want to see us as Americans restore our founding values and I want to see us restore our pride in being Americans. That's my objective. That's my ambition is to get uh, the next generation back to where they understand the wonderful history of this country. And, the, and they're proud of being an American. And they don't focus on the negative. They know about it, but they focus on the positives of what we've done. But you know, Tom Trento told you I got hit with a 50 caliber. A couple of them, I guess. We're coming into a little island of Grenada. Beautiful little Caribbean island. I don't know if you've ever been there, but go. Take a cruise. Go down to this beautiful island. The Cubans and the communists in 1983 were building an airfield there that would put Russian bombers and Russian fighters within range of the United States. And a great man said, not in my hemisphere you won't, and not on my watch. And that man's name was Ronald Reagan. Yes! Yay! And he said, no way. And he told us in the Delta Force to spearhead the operation to go in and, and to take that island away from the Cubans and the communists and to turn it back over to the people of Grenada, many of which had been locked up and put in prison. And I was sitting in the door of the lead Black Hawk on the way in and the people down as the, as the sun was just coming up over the island of Grenada on the morning of the 25th of October, 1983. I'm sitting in the door of the Black Hawk. First time we'd ever used Black Hawks. And I looked down in the jungle and people were waving. Waving at us from the jungle. I said, it's going to be a great day. We came up on our target, which was Richmond Hill Prison, where all the political prisoners were being held. And all of a sudden, I started seeing red tracers and green tracers, and they were coming through the rotor blades and I heard the popping sound and we were shooting back and we were and we'd take out a gun and placement and the next thing another one would pop up and we'd be getting hit again. My helicopter was hit 54 times with 50 caliber. But all of a sudden I felt wham, wham, I'm hit. I thought they had actually shot my arm off. After the second time we tried to get in there, we went out to sea and they landed me on a carrier and they operated on me right away and they took, brought me back to Fort Bragg and they operated on me at Fort Bragg and they said, when I woke up, they said, we're going to have to take your arm off. See, I'd been hit up through the left side of my chest here and then I'd been, I'd been hit right up through my armpit. Part of the 50 cal came out the top of my shoulder. And they said, we're going to take your arm off. Well, first of all, I looked at him and I said, you just do the best you can because I trust God. My God's going to take care of me. You just do the best you can. They put me in the hospital at Fort Bragg. I was in terrible pain and I was laying there and I was saying, why? Why, God, did you let this happen to me? Pretty arrogant question, wasn't it? Why me? Why not me is really the question. Well, why me? And I was laying there saying, God, did they tell me I'm going to go through the rest of my life with one arm? Why? What's it all for? It's just a little island down in the Caribbean. 350,000 people. Was it really worth it? This was two days after we'd gone into Grenada and liberated that island. And all of a sudden I looked up and in the room I was laying in there at Fort Bragg there was a television up on the wall and I, suddenly CNN went back to Grenada and there was a reporter with a microphone going around the island and interviewing people and he found this old woman, an old woman from Grenada and I swear i would never forget she had one tooth. It was right here on the left side and she loved to smile. Even though she only had one tooth and this CNN reporter went up obviously thinking that he was going to get this woman to be critical 
of this U.S. invasion of her country. And I'm laying there in the hospital saying, God, why? Was it worth it? Was it really worth it? And they shoved the microphone in this old woman's face and they said, what do you think about this U.S. invasion of your homeland? And I remember so well the old lady said, God bless Ronald Reagan and God bless America. I said, God bless America. 